Hello, Sublation Media viewers and readers. It's me again, Douglas Lane. And in this video, I'll be continuing my backward trek through Gita Board's Society of the Spectacle. This time, I'll be discussing the second chapter of the book, entitled The Commodity of Spectacle. Along the way, I'll also talk about Theodore Adorno's essay on the fetish character in music and the regression of listening. And I'll discuss the death of the American corporation, Radio Shack. Julie, ready to go? Are you kidding? Hey, you want to play hockey? We got a new TV scoreboard game from Radio Shack. I'm ready. A great gift idea. An exciting entertainment bargain for year-round fun. The sale price TV games. Only at Radio Shack. The first paragraph of the second chapter in Society of the Spectacle is a reworking of the beginning of Section 4 of Capital, entitled The Fetishism of Commodities and the Secrets Thereof. Marx wrote, A commodity appears, at first sight, a very trivial thing, and easily understood. Its analysis shows that it is, in reality, a very queer thing, abounding in metaphysical subtleties and theological niceties. Whereas De Boer wrote, in the spectacle's basic practice of incorporating into itself all the fluid aspects of human activity so as to possess them in a congealed form, and inverting living values into purely abstract values, we recognize our old enemy, the commodity, which seems at first glance so trivial and obvious, yet which is actually so complex and full of metaphysical subtleties. It is obvious, I think, that if we are to understand what De Boer is saying about his concept of the spectacle, we must first understand what Marx meant when he wrote about the fetish nature of the commodity. Think of all the things you can do with a chair. You can sit on it, you can sit on it, you can sit on it, sit on a chair. For Marx, commodities appear as simple and obvious things because of their use values. A wood table, a hot dog, a light bulb, a wool coat. These things are all useful commodities. We can sit at a table, eat a hot dog, light our homes with a light bulb, and stay warm by wearing a wool coat. However, commodities are bizarre, mystical, and occult, not because of the various particular uses they can be put to, but because of how they are in an abstract sense, all the same. A wool coat is equal to 20 yards of linen, or to 50 hot dogs, or to a dozen light bulbs. But the substance that the various commodities contain, the value of them that can be measured and exchanged equally, does not appear to the naked eye. Rather, it is a social system of productive labor, the network of relations between people making things and exchanging things, that creates this secondary value that is measured in various denominations of money. However, the network of relations that coordinates the productive work of people and the distribution of goods is not obvious. People can't just decide to produce goods for one another. They can't simply decide to exchange goods based on their feelings or ideas about each other, but rather the way they produce things and the rate at which they produce things sets up their relations. And because of this, the social relations between people appear as social relationships between things, between commodities. For De Boer, the spectacle is the way this world wherein social relationships between people appear as relationships between things is represented in images and sound. It is a culture of alienated living, a justification for our estrangement from one another and the actual experience of the disappearance of the qualitative from our lives. In order to better understand what this disappearance of quality from our lives is, how it appears, I want to turn away from De Boer for a moment and pick up Adorno. In his essay on the fetish character in music and the regression of listening, Adorno explains how it has come to be that the public can no longer tell the difference between the enjoyment of Beethoven's Seventh Symphony and the enjoyment of a bikini. What he meant was not just 
that the mass production of commodity culture created an audience without refinement or good taste, an audience reduced to pure libidinal reaction, but rather that even this libidinal reaction had gone missing. We have become alienated from the music we listen to, can barely hear it at all, and can no longer take it up in its totality or understand that what we're listening to has a total meaning. Rather, we only hear music in a fragmented way. We hear the hook, the beat, the refrain, and the more familiar these things are, the more we like them. That is, the more absent we can be, the less engagement is required, the more easily we can claim to enjoy what we're hearing. Ultimately, what we enjoy is participating in the successful exchange of money for property. A hit song that goes viral on YouTube is something worthy of a listen precisely because it has generated so much cash. In the last video, I described DeBoer's understanding of the celebrity as a person who is famous for being famous. A celebrity might represent a value, for instance, the value of intellect or strength, and become famous for this representation. But this fame rests upon our knowledge that they are not, in fact, what they appear to be. I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV. And if your child had a cough, she'd get just what the doctor orders. <laughs> When it comes to a hit song, or a supermodel, or an action hero, the same things apply. What we enjoy in these spectacles is their successful appearance in the market, their domination of our consciousness, the way in which they fill in for something that is lacking. Dell! Wonder Woman. We've got to stop meeting like this. For example, the song In the Summertime by Mungo Jerry is an imitation of folk and skiffle music, a facsimile of early 20th century do-it-yourself music, quoting the style of the jug band and describing summertime fun, a description that amounts to a celebration of leisure time, which of course only exists in relation to a mode of work that is completely alien to the individual and his or her desires. It is remembered today through a lens of nostalgia that is itself alienated. Having sold around 30 million records, it is within the top 10 most successful songs in pop history and lingers on in our memory even as the culture and life it celebrates. Already a faded memory in 1970 has nearly completely extinguished itself. We're traveling through a dimension both of sound and ideas. We're at a place where the mind can comprehend and devise a solar radio, a wireless transmitter, measure time and light. An even more obvious example of how the spectacle involves an emptying out of real value, a replacement of a life that is engaged with history for the history of alienation, would be this Super Bowl advertisement for Radio Shack that ran in 2014. Radio Shack? Okay. What? The 80s called. They want their store back. Radio Shack was founded in the first quarter of the 20th century as a retail outlet for ham radio equipment. In his essay on the fetish character in music, Adorno describes a ham radio operator this way. As Radio Ham, he becomes the discoverer of just those industrial products which are interested in being discovered by him. He brings nothing home which would not be delivered to his house. The adventurers of pseudo-activity have already organized themselves on a large scale. The radio amateurs have printed verification cards sent to them by the shortwave stations they have discovered and hold contests in which the winner is the one who can produce the most such cards. All this is carefully fostered from above. That is, from the start, the use values on offer at Radio Shack were defined by mass culture, by the industrial order, and by the commodity. By 2014, the technological order had reorganized around digital technologies that were, for the most part, sealed up and out of reach of hobbyists. So even the false appearance of participation 
that the ham radio hobbyists consumed had disappeared. All that was left of the original company was a brand name. Radio Shack was iconic but empty. By 2014, there was nearly no cultural memory of the values it had originally represented, but only a vague association amongst Gen X and millennial consumers between the brand and the era when it had been relevant. Eric Estrada, Mary Lou Retton, and Hulk Hogan have nothing to do with Radio Shack except for the coincidence of their appearance in time or history. They had been stars on TV when Radio Shack was still profitable. As DeBoer explains at the end of Chapter 2, consciousness of desire and desire for consciousness are the same project. The project that in its negative form seeks the abolition of classes and thus the worker's direct possession of every aspect of their activity. The opposite of this project is the society of the spectacle, where the commodity contemplates itself in a world of its own making. Well, today, that world is a world of NFTs, financialized obligations, and perpetual material and cultural crisis.